and welcome to the Linus Talk. This episode is supported and facilitated by Bharatvata, one of uh, Indian's uh, leading podcast uh, producers on politics, policy and uh, society. My guest today is Colonel Marcus Reisner. He is Head of Research and Development Department of the Austrian Theresian Military Academy and he's also currently Commander of the Honor Guard in Austria. Colonel Reisner, welcome to this uh, podcast. Hello, thank you very much and uh, thanks for having me. As you can guess, uh, our topic today is the first anniversary of Russia's war against Ukraine. It started on February 24th uh, last year and we would like uh, to uh, cover um, the relevant uh, developments. Uh, so we start first and foremost with a very short wrap up uh, from the perspective of Colonel uh, Reisner when it comes to the key uh, breakthroughs and the key moments in the war so far in the last 12, mon um, 12 months. Uh, then we will move also, of course, to the current uh, state of affairs. So, Colonel Reisner, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So let me do a short per force ride through the last 12 months and to explain a little bit more in detail what are the, what are the key elements which we have seen in the last 12 months. I think we can agree that the, uh, we can uh, divide those 12 months more or less in four phases. The first phase was um, for a lot of people and also experts, very surprisingly, the successful operation of the Ukrainian armed forces at the beginning of the war against the Russian armed forces. Um, the, the corner mark of this first phase was, of course, the withdrawal of uh, the Russian troops from the Kiev uh, region, which had a very, very huge uh, moral impact, a positive one on the Ukrainian forces, because they, at that time, really thought that they can fight against the Russian armed forces and there can be success. So what then happened was uh, phase number two. While in the first phase, the Ukrainians implied very successfully maneuver or mobile warfare against the Russian troops. In the second phase, the Russians tried to force the Ukrainians into a war of attrition. So already at that time, we had first signs of a war of attrition. That was the time, if you remember, you know, the battle for Lysyshansk and Severodonetsk, when the Russians actually were able to break through the first of line of defense uh, at the Popasna, which in the, is in the east of the country, first line of defense in the, the Donbass region. At that time, it was also clear that uh, ammunition and other resources will be decisive and the West started to uh, supply weapons uh, to the Ukrainian side, especially artillery systems, artillery ammunition, and of course, then the heavy systems like uh, tanks and others. And of course, also the first air defense uh, systems which appear on the battlefield. Third phase uh, was more or less initiated by the introduction of the HIMARS system, this multiple round rocket launch system, because uh, it was able by using the HIMARS system to attack the uh, Russian logistic uh, organization, the also command and control organization. And that uh, gave the Ukrainians time to prepare their own offensives, which later happened in uh, Kharkiv and also in Kherson. In the beginning, Kherson was not so successful because there was heavy attrition done by the Russians on the Ukrainian forces uh, in the Kherson area. But uh, otherwise, on the uh, front at Kharkiv, by using uh, surprise elements, they were able to uh, establish a breakthrough. Uh, and actually, the Russian troops even fleed back uh, over the um, Oskil River to the east uh, of uh, Kupiansk, more or less. Uh. In Kherson, we can say pretty much there was very likely a deal done uh, in between the, the, the fighting factions because uh, out of the southern 13,000 troops more or less were able to withdraw via three bridges, heavily damaged bridges on the other side of the Dnieper. Those successes from the Ukrainian side pretty much ended the third phase and the fourth phase was pretty much uh, initiated by a new element, an element of terror by the Russian side because the Russians started at the beginning of October, on the 10th of October, to attack on the strategic level the critical infrastructure of Ukraine by using uh, missiles, uh, cruise missiles, and also Iranian drones. And uh, those attacks were quite uh, heavy over the next week. So we have now the, the 14th wave on the 18th of February because they treated the critical infrastructure of Ukraine in a very bad way. You just have to look at a satellite picture of, uh, let's say, Ukraine and Russia, and then you can see the difference because Ukraine is pretty much uh, blacked out while Russia and Moscow is still full of lights. And those force phase, pretty much, um, that's where we are at the moment, pretty much a stalemate. Uh, it's pretty much like something like a, a limbo situation. Again, the Russians were able to force the Ukrainians into 
a war of attrition, a, a trench war for situation like in the First World War. So the Ukrainians are, let's say, more or less facing a lot of um, artillery fire, uh, heavy pushes from the Russian side, especially in the Bakhmut area. And you also can uh, say that the so-called Russian offensive, the spring offensive more or less has started. Of course, the Russians will not tell us that they have started the operation, but we can see it very clearly on the battlefield. And um, there are certain areas where the Russians started more or less to attack in direction of the uh, um, of the uh, Ukrainian positions. So this is, for example, the case in Kremina. It's also the case um, in Pakhmut, uh, Marinka, and even in the south as Ugledar. So that is the situation for the moment, Verina. Okay, so uh, now we know that it's a stalemate situation, that it is more or less, uh, you know, a preparation for the next escalation phase. Uh, and uh, some military experts are already pointing to the fact that uh, Russia has started, in fact, its military offense, even though that it's not really clear what exactly the goal of this is. Uh, so could you elaborate a little bit of uh, that, what's uh, coming next? Uh, obviously, there is this anticipation that Russia needs a military victory, at least in Donbass, if it wants to uh, start pushing for some kind of uh, ceasefire or peace. Uh, but also Ukraine is preparing for a counteroffensive. Give us uh, a little bit uh, the, 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 the outlook. So the, the key uh, to understand more or less what happened uh, during the last 12 months is, of course, uh, the fact that you have to look, especially at the beginning of uh, the Russian operations uh, last year, and you have also to have a look at uh, what happened in 2014. So in 2014, uh, the Ukrainians understood that they weren't able, because they weren't able to stop the Russians at the border, that if the Russians will come again, they have to do it in a different way when it comes to more or less defending your country, they have to change their tactics. And that's what they did, because at the beginning of the war last year, uh, what happens, the Ukrainians pretty much let the Russians in for several days and then started to attack the rear areas, the supply lines and things like that. The Russian idea was uh, to do something what the Americans did in 2003 in Iraq. Uh, they called it a uh, shock and awe at that time. So the idea was to um, more or less uh, have some kind of decapitation strike in the Kiev uh, region, but that failed, as we all know. And now the problem immediately uh, was that the, the Russian troops were lacking infantry. That was the biggest problem because they were invading the country with about 200,000 soldiers. And of course, if you look at the size of the country, um, that was not enough. And since that time, since the beginning of the, the invasion last year, the Russians are still struggling to bring infantry. This is why the mobilization is so important. And at the moment, unfortunately, we have to say that they're having about 400,000 soldiers around. Uh, all over the eastern Ukraine. And of course, by using those soldiers, they're trying um, to gain uh, successes like they are trying to uh, take in Bakhmut and also in Ukledar in the south. But uh, the Ukrainians have prepared themselves. The weapons are coming in from the west. So those weapons, they are making a difference. That's very important to understand. Of course, uh, the Europeans struggling to get all these weapons together and also the US um, is trying to make the best out of it, especially when it comes to ammunition, for example, because there is a ammunition hunger, especially from the Ukrainian side, but they do, they do make a difference. And the thing is, it's important that Ukraine is again able to start an offensive because the longer they wait, the more the Russians are able to prepare themselves for this offensive because they can dig in, they can bring in more forces. And this is why it is at the moment a critical moment and the next weeks and months to come will be decisive. I will quote at this point um, uh, General Budanov, who is the, the head of the military intelligence of Ukraine, and he said the situation is tricky. It's like in a soccer game, we're having a score of one to one, and uh, we are in the 17th minute, so the next uh, weeks and months to come will be interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, before before we move to these uh, important uh, players uh, from outside, the external, of course, dimension, I would like to ask you uh, uh, another question that is very much related to your work. Uh, since you have been covering uh, the war from the day one, and uh, could you tell us a little bit how actually this assessment is taking place? What kind of methodolog methodologies, what kind of uh, instruments and tools you and your colleagues are using to actually arrive at this uh, uh, analysis and assessments? Uh, do you work with open source or are you actually relying more on intelligence reports? 
Okay, that's that's a very important question because it's always a question uh, about sources, more or less. Yeah? So first of all, you have to understand that my job is at uh, more or less at the head of the Department for Research and Development to look especially at the current uh, conflicts, uh, at the way more warfare is changing, because we want to make sure that the young officers, the new uh, leaders in our armed forces have an understanding of what is happening uh, when they are actually, let's say, in the conflict zone. Yeah? As you know, Austria is a neutral country. We are still um, more or less uh, heavily preparing everything we have for national defense on our own. So we are not, neighbor, NATO, not a NATO member, we are a NATO PFP member. Uh, but there is a long tradition of especially foreign deployments. So the Austrian Armed Forces started to have foreign deployments already in the 1960s. And so we have troops, uh, or we had troops in Afghanistan, Mali, Sahel, uh, and so on and so on. And this is important to understand what, what kind of warfare is happening there. Uh, we did a, a lot of research already uh, when it came to the situation, the development situation in Ukraine in 2014, because we wanted to understand how actually the Russians were able to um, inflict those quite heavy blows on the Ukrainian side by taking Crimea and also, you know, the fights in the separatist areas. So at that time, we already started to have a clear um, or better look and understanding about the situation. It's very important that you have a look, uh, especially into the summer of 2014, because there are some key battles which still have an impact uh, today, uh, especially when it comes to Ukrainian tactics. So there are names like Selenopilia, that was uh, the case when a brigade in the open was destroyed by Russian artillery fire. That were the cauldron battles of Ilovaisk and the Balsevo. And the ones who fought at that time as young company and battalion commanders of the Ukrainian, on the Ukrainian side, they are now the, the battalion and even brigade commanders. So they understood how the Russians actually are fighting and what they have to do to be successful against them. What we do is we do a, a huge research on all the social media um, things which are available. So we're watching videos. We are trying to make sure that we cover what is talked in certain uh, channels or on Telegram or we conduct it, whatever it is. And uh, as you know, everyone is a censor. So you just have to look uh, in detail what is shared, what kind of information. And as a military person, if you look at a certain video, um, it's a completely different view compared to a civilian who is doing that because, okay, I can identify the tank. I know that certain unit has this certain tank and then you'll see little, little things so I can actually assess, okay, where does this tank come from? Is this an assigned for a unit, whatever they are doing? And, and those are the things we actually can assess in a way that we can have a clear picture of what is going on. And uh, I'm doing this now already for over one year in a very intensive way. So I have a folder for every day, which is uh, filled with videos. And that uh, gives you the idea of what is going on more or less on the front lines. And this is the basis of our analysis and the basis of for our YouTube videos, as you know. One of the things that you mentioned, uh, of course, was the weapon uh, weapons delivery. And uh, we've noticed that uh, the West was uh, kind of cautious at the beginning of the war uh, when it comes to expectations uh, and also anticipations uh, for the way how the war will uh, actually uh, be conducted and uh, also the um, possible outcomes. So uh, we know for sure uh, 12 months later that it was the United States that was very swift in supp uh, supplying Ukraine with uh, weapons. And if it had not been for the United States, uh, Ukraine would have been actually already um, defeated uh, by Russia. Uh, so um, could you give me uh, your view on that matter? Why after 12 months, there is still this kind of uh, cautious um, uh, and careful, let's say, um, attitude towards uh, the further weapons delivery. We've heard actually from the Ukrainian, uh, from the Ukrainian president and the Ukrainian elite that uh, they need a lot of uh, weapons and ammunition uh, for uh, the upcoming uh, counter offensive. Um, and is it only the political side of it? Because it's very, very uh, tough to communicate to the own population in Europe what is really at stake, or is it uh, also a military component that is included uh, in the equation? Okay, so you, you, that's a very important question, and I would actually start to answer the question by uh, asking five questions, and you can start uh, by your own to give an answer on those five questions, okay? Let's first of all start uh, with the delivery of certain weapon systems. So first of all, 
we all, I guess, agree that the HIMA system, this multiple rocket launch system, um, made a difference in summer. And the Ukrainians are requesting 50 to 100, which is a completely, um, uh, absolutely right, uh, right assessment. But they only got 20 from the Americans. Uh, so why only 20, but not 50 and 100 like they were requesting? Because we have seen that the HIMA system made a difference. It had an impact, not a decisive one, but there was an impact. Second question, uh, fighter planes. We still have a discussion, should we deliver fighter planes to the Ukrainians or not? Uh, also again, Biden more or less said, no, this is not on the table. Also the, the German defense minister just recently said, okay, we have now delivered the tanks, no fighter planes at the moment. So why is it the case that the Ukrainians are not getting those fighter planes? Because already in the beginning of the war, the Ukrainian air force was hit very hard by the Russian side. So, and as you all know, uh, you need an, Workable, functional air force, more or less, if you want to go into the offensive again. Third question, attackants. Well, these are those rockets. These are ground-to-ground -ground rockets with a distance or range of 300 kilometers. Um, the HIMARS had 70 kilometers. Uh, in the Rammstein, just recently, they uh, discussed to deliver the so-called ground launch small diameter bomb, which has a range of 160 kilometers. But the attackants are still not on the table. So why is it that those attackants are uh, not delivered to the Ukrainians because they would make actually quite a difference uh, because then the Ukrainians can attack um, the Russian command and control structure, the logistic elements, which are now out of the range of the HIMARS system, for example. Yeah. The next thing would be if you look a little bit on uh, all these rockets and cruise missiles and even Iranian drones, who, uh, which are used against the, the Ukrainian critical infrastructure, because as you know, all those cruise missiles, drones, they are flying by using a coordination, a coordination coordinates more or less like the GPS. The Russians are losing the, the global system. So why is it not the case that the Americans, for example, start to jam or even destroy those navigation system because they can do it actually. So this is also not uh, happening. And the last question, which I pointed out a little bit already in my last uh, answer is the question of Kherson, which I call a little bit uh, the Russian Dunkirk, because how could it be that 30,000 Russian troops were able to withdraw in nearly one night, uh, over three uh, heavily damaged bridges with all the equipment they had. And those troops were the ones they used later on in Melitopol uh, to counter a possible Ukrainian offensive and, of course, in Bakhmut. So the answer is, and this is the, the hard thing, uh, and the big elephant in the room is, of course, the nuclear armament of the Russian side. So you have to understand that it's always about... <clears throat> symmetry and asymmetry. So whenever the Russians are having success, so when the situation is becoming asymmetric, the Ukrainians will get those weapon systems will make, which would make it uh, possible for them to have a symmetric situation again. But nothing more. Why? Because it's the strategy, especially from the United States, to avoid that the Russians are cornered. Because if they are cornered, they might do something irrational. And as you might remember, at Kherson, it was already discussed, Will the Russians maybe use tactical nukes because of the fake fact that the more or less 30,000 troops are encircled? And this is uh, more or less uh, the strategy which is applied. There is even a term for it. It's called boiling the frog. So the idea is to boil the frog um, until the moment that uh, more or less is getting unconscious and dying, but not to hit him too, too, too fast to avoid that he jumps out more or less uh, of the bubble. And this is the problem. Because what does it mean? It means that those, this war will go on. So we will see all the weapon deliveries which are necessary to hold the Russians at bay, but nothing more because we want to avoid that they are using nuclear weapons. And as you all know, nuclear weapons make a difference. Uh, it was already the case, um, uh, let's say in Korea, as you know, because after the success of uh, the uh, North Korean troops assisted by the Chinese, it was considered by American generals to use nuclear weapons, and as we all know, it uh, didn't happen, but it gives you an idea, which is still valid until today, that this makes a big difference. So whenever it comes to weapon deliveries, we always have to make a very clear, uh, also an assessment that this is also related how the other will react. And the question is, um, how long will this go on? We don't know, but the hope of the West is that the Russians at a certain point will understand that they cannot win that war and will start I think very likely first via hidden channels to somehow, let's say, offer uh, uh, the clear intent to start negotiations, which then hopefully will end the war. Mm -hmm. 
So the question, of course, is that obviously there will be negotiations, uh, but first and foremost, we will have to see uh, some military uh, successes on the ground. Um, and of course, we very much hope that in this critical phase of the war, Ukraine once again will go against the oaths, because in every phase of this war, um, there was a, a kind of wrong assessment, more or less, about the real possibilities of the Ukrainian army in a sense that, um, as we remember very well, in the first phase, uh, there was uh, practically no, or let's say almost no expectation uh, for the Ukrainian army to push away the Russian troops uh, in the north. Uh, then we saw also what happened in the summer, uh, specifically in uh, Kharkiv and then later in Kherson. And once again, the Ukrainian army is saying we are able able to push the Russian troops away, but uh, you need to enable us to do so. Do you think that uh, the, the West will uh, finally arrive at a strategic consensus about the ultimate goal? That being not just to provide, uh, as you said, um, uh, weapons and uh, ammunition for Ukraine to be able to sustain the next uh, offense, offensive uh, push from the Russians, but uh, in fact, to be able to um, make a significant difference on the fronts. Will we see this kind of strategic consensus on well, the side of the <clears> West? This, yeah. And second question I have is, do you think that the, 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 the final goals on behalf of Russia uh, have changed? After 12 well, months? Well, I think uh, let's, let's, let's start with the, with the last thing uh, you said. I, at the moment, I think we can uh, say very clearly that the Russian uh, aim hasn't changed. Um, it was even repeated uh, in Putin's talk uh, just yesterday because he again stressed what the aim of uh, Russia is. And this is pretty much to destroy Ukraine, like it was said already one year ago in his speech on the 21st of February 2022. Uh, the, the problem is that we still have two camps, more or less, in the West. So the one camp uh, is the one who says, okay, let's go. Uh, all in, uh, let's give them all the things they need, uh, like the, the British Prime Minister just recently said, you don't have to, to have your weapons at home, give it to the Ukrainians because there is the front and this is where we have to fight. So this is uh, the one side which we all have, which we see in all the discussions. Huh? But there is also the other camp, uh, which also has prominent um, members like um, even greater European states like the Germans or the French or even the Italians, something like this. And they say, well, pooh, we have to come up with some kind of negotiated solution uh, of that conflict. And that means we have to um, uh, try to find a solution that because there is also an economical war, uh, which uh, makes uh, maybe some very harsh problems in the future. Because as you know, Europe consumed 42% of uh, its uh, resources from uh, Russia. And uh, this is more or less on, at stake in the, in the future. So we don't know how this actually Will happen. Uh, everyone is hoping for the Norwegian gas, for example, or for other contracts. So we don't know how will be the outcome on on the long term here. So you still have uh, these discussions, and also in between the European U unity, which was really surprising and really impressing. What what is what that happened here? But there are some small cracks. Yeah, just look at the Hungarians. Or even, let's say, in the near surrounding, look at the Turks, for example, because they are trying to make out the best uh, of this situation. And of course, uh, there are some other regional powers like the Iranians who also give um, more or less um, the necessary means to the Russians, for example. And then, of course, we have the big players behind, like it is with China and Russia, and of course, in Europe, it's with the United States. Yeah? So there is still no real complete consensus, which then um, is translated in a clear strategy. The strategy at the moment is Russia should not win. And how this will be actually done, this is a little bit of question at the moment, because they are the ones who say, well, we have to be careful and uh, let's say go step by step, because as I said, there is the big elephant in the room, and this is that the Russians are doing some irrational things, and the other ones are saying, well, we have to hurry up because now it's the time and don't care about the atomic weapons because they will not use them because uh, this is something which they never will do. Yeah? I cannot give you a complete answer on that. I can just tell you that in 10 to 15 years, the historians will tell you that it was very clear and it was exactly um, that it will happen like this, like we have seen, but this is not the case. So we still have to wait for the next weeks and months to come. Let me just a little bit elaborate on the success of the Ukrainians because this is also important. Because um, also here I would like to stress that in the beginning, um, nearly all experts were not expecting that the Ukrainians uh, will be able to fight that, that kind of successful. 
there is a very famous uh, interview uh, of uh, the head of the uh, United States Military Intelligence Service, uh, General Barriers, where he states in front of Congress members uh, certain aspects of the of the beginning of the war, and he said, "Okay, we were all surprised. No one was actually expecting that the Ukrainians will be so successful." But in the the first days, when the conflict more or less was um, decided in a positive way for the Ukrainians because it was clear that this shock and also the chief of the Russians will not work. A lot of things happened. For example, as you know, modern wars uh, are fought over several domains. So there's the land domain, the air domain, sea, space, information domain, and so on and so on. And it's also about intelligence. So for example, the Americans were starting to give intelligence nearly in time due to Ukrainians. So this is very important because then the Ukrainians were able, because they had a clear picture about the Russian forces layout to start to attack the key knots of the uh, Russian side, the command and control structure, for example. This is why we have seen in the beginning uh, several Russian generals who were killed more or less by uh, precise strikes of the Ukrainian side. Yeah? It was of course also the Ukrainian tactic and it was, of course, also the Ukrainian forces, because it, it, it was not the Ukrainian soldiers with an anti-tank weapon in its hand to stop the Russians. It was the Ukrainian armed forces. And the Ukrainian armed forces at the beginning of the war were the strongest armed forces in Europe. So this is also important to understand. But those forces were treated till summer. In summer, then, the heavy weapon systems were coming in from the West. Those systems were then used in uh, Kharkiv and Kherson, but also those systems were treated. So now the situation is that Ukrainian armed forces, especially the land forces, they have to refill a third time. This is why just recently uh, General Solution said, we need another 300 tanks, we need another six to 700 infantry fighting vehicles, we need another 500 artillery systems. So there are a lot of things uh, which are also very important to understand. Also, when you, when you look at the offensives, Kiev was a success, a very important success, but the Russians withdraw their troops by intention. So they tried to make the best out of the worst situation in the beginning. They tried to form a main effort, and that was in Donbass. That was uh, behind more or less the success of the Ukrainians in Kiev. Then Kherson was done in a very clever way. The Ukrainians, with the help of the Americans, were able to find out that there are thinned out lines uh, in the rear of the Russian troops. They broke through that lines with a small battle group, and then uh, by using light elements, they drove as much as, as fast as possible into the depths of the country to the east and then they, they started to, to stop in all the villages. They made videos by f use, using the Ukrainian flag in the middle of the square of, of the, the little village. Those videos were shared in telegram channels. The Russians saw this and thought, okay, ooh, Ukrainians are just already behind us and then they just fleed. So that was a really, <laughs> from a military perspective, a very, very clever conducted uh, and intelligent conducted operation. Kherson was difficult because in this open area, the, the Ukrainians who were trying to attack in three certain areas of uh, the, the bridgehead, they were treated heavily by the Russians. And then, of course, the, the deal, as we think, was made in the background and then this withdrawal happened. But now the situation is the Ukrainians are facing now consolidated Russians because those Russians, they have now a line which is more easily to defend than it was before because in the south there's the Dnieper River between the Ukrainians and the Russians and in the in the center and in the east they more or less have consolidated themselves by bringing in more infantry, by digging in, by preparing forces to attack and now we are again in a limbo situation and this is uh, the situation we have at the moment which makes it so difficult uh, to assess very clearly how the next weeks and months will uh, really, um, let's say, how uh, develop in a way. But for the moment, we can say the Russians have started the offensive, but they are not having the kind of success they were expecting. So they have to bring in more, which, of course, uh, goes in line with the strategy to attrit the Russians on the long term. And therefore, the Ukrainians have to have all the, the, the needs uh, available, which gives them the possibility to hold the Russians at bay. Mm -hmm. And now you outlined this multidimensional approach of Russia. Can we actually say that Russia also launched a non-kinetic war, that means a war by non-military means, against the European security order, not against a specific European state? So yes, of course, politics uh, nowadays is struggling uh, with the word war, but uh, isn't it actually better to explain to the society that war has very different dimensions and this non-kinetic warfare against the European security order is uh, means that Russia is striving to destroy 
the current, the existing security order in uh, Europe because it was not beneficial uh, for the Russian interests. And by doing so, so practically not just by subjugating Ukraine, but by creating new realities on the ground, it would be able to operate in a much cha more chaotic and much more unstable uh, vacuum situation in which it could, of course, engage with uh, those uh, European countries that are, let's say, uh, more Russia friendly and this non-kinetic warfare, you pointed to some of uh, these dimensions such as the information warfare, the nuclear blackmail, the weaponization of commodities. Uh, we have many, many layers, the cyber domain, the, uh, the space domain and so on. So uh, why, is, uh, why is it that um, uh, the current uh, political elites in Europe are in generally struggling to communicate to people that this is also the case, that it is actually a war that is being waged against all of us, uh, as I said, by non-military means, and that it is in our interest to do anything possible to actually prevent Russia from winning, first and foremost. Well, this is this is absolutely a very, very important point. And I we even made a video about this, uh, what we call the cognitive warfare, so the fight for or minds or even brains more or less because um, after the shock of, of the Russian side when they actually found out that there will be not uh, an easy going operation like they have uh, more or less uh, thought it will happen and that they were not greeted by flowers but with artillery shells after the shock moment of course they started immediately to try to find out where are our Achilles heels more or less where they actually can attack the Europeans but especially the Europeans yeah? you have to understand um, the military um, has a, a term it's called uh, the, the center of gravity which pretty much describes uh, the core element which you have to secure to protect to, to make sure that this works if you would like to, to fight a war especially a long war the center of gravity for the ukrainians is the assistance of the west if there is no assistance from the west the ukrainians will be not able to fight this war longer not because there is not the will the will is uh, around but because there is not the resources this is the problem huh? Uh, and by the way, the center of gravity on the Russian side is, of course, the cohesion of the people around the regime. And as long as this is available, they will go on and fight the, the Ukrainians. But what are the Russians doing now? They try to fight this center of gravity. And how do they do this? Uh, as you already said, by nuclear blackmailing, for example, this is one of the things they do. They also try to explain to us, OK, if there is not um, the grain available, which is coming from Ukraine, then it will be very problematic because then we will have a, a situation of hunger in uh, let's say the North African countries and this will lead to migration and migration is some kind of a hot topic in Europe. So this is another example for course, of course, and of course the economical situation. So there's always um, this little information in different sources. Okay, if you don't stop the war now, then you will be uh, facing an economical collapse, which will be devastating. Yeah? So th that's what they do actually. And you have to understand it's an unfortunate situation because uh, we had two years of Corona, which uh, brought the, the situation with us, especially in the European countries. And I would even say this is a problem of luxury in a way that a lot of people thought that the things which were done to, let's say, to counter this Corona crisis are not done in a good way. Yeah? And so the, the field is more or less prepared for the information operations of the Russians because the same, the same institutions, the same troll farms who worked on us during the Corona time, they are now working on us by, let's say, nuclear blackmailing us and things like that. And this is the, the problematic situation. As, as you know, our politicians are all the result of a democratic, democratic process, so free elections and all this kind of stuff. And of course, what the Russians do and what they did, actually, when uh, you think about the, um, the elections in the United States, which the Russians even openly said, Prigozhin just recently said, well, we, we did it there. That's what they did also here, because they think that when they are able to influence the Europeans, uh, their minds, then they can make them in a way hesitating to assist the politicians, which are currently the ones who are assisting Ukraine, and this will have on the long term a good outcome for them. And of course, this can happen. We don't know it, but uh, we have to be clear and straightforward to understand that this is happening. It's not something which has to do with conspiracy or whatever it is. This is happening pretty much, and uh, we have to understand this. Yeah.
And then, of course, we have now the very sensitive uh, topic of uh, the so-called proxy war, right? Uh, right now, uh, there are many speculations about uh, this war. So Russia's war is, by all definitions, not a proxy war. Uh, and it's also not a NATO-Russia war. But um, now there is a new moment. You mentioned uh, how the Americans actually provided intelligence uh, and are providing intelligence to the Ukrainians. And if you remember at the beginning of, uh, actually prior to the beginning of the war, the Americans were also providing intelligence to the Chinese. In fact, they, they met them and they tried to warn them of the upcoming war. And we know for a fact that the Chinese did not buy it, that they did not withdraw their citizens. And in fact, there are already first, let's say, investigative um, uh, articles uh, pointing to the possibility that uh, China may have known something, sort of, uh, an in, uh, let's say, an implication of um, of, uh, of the um, uh, joint declaration, the meeting, the summit between Xi Jinping and, uh, uh, and Putin on uh, 4th of February. And probably during this summit, uh, the Russian president have, has somehow mentioned the topic of dealing with, uh, with uh, a special military operation. Anyway, 12 months fast forward, once again, the Americans are now warning that China may provide little assistance to Russia. And you mentioned already, Russia is struggling. Russia has adapted, uh, obviously, but uh, at, the, at the end of the day, even with, the, with this uh, mobilization waves, it is struggling to achieve a significant military success. So my question uh, for you is, if China decides to provide uh, military assistance to Russia, are we not going to witness the emergence of a real proxy war because first Russia is obviously no longer a systemic player it is a relevant it is a significant if you like a key geopolitical player with the largest nuclear uh, arsenal and yet not a systemic player and in this newly emerging systemic conflict between China and United States with the two supporting two sides of a, of a war are we actually not going to witness a proxy war. Absolutely. Uh, I completely agree with that. Um, unfortunately, I have to tell you that there are several elephants in the room, more or less. So we have uh, talked about the one, which is the, the nuclear war elephant, more or less. Uh, and then there is even another one, which is the alliance elephant. So what we can see is that the, the world is changing. It's not uh, anymore a multipolar world. It's a unipolar, uh, it's, it's uh, not a unipolar world. It's becoming more and more so a multipolar world. Um, just take uh, India, for example, uh, the Indian uh, foreign minister just recently, several uh, repeated times actually, uh, stated very clearly to the Europeans, your problems in Europe are not our problems. Yeah? And if you are getting the resources now from uh, Russia in a cheaper way, it's fine for us. And if you can sell those resources to the double or third price to you Europeans, that's fine. Yeah? Which is, from my opinion, completely understandable because um, it might be that now is the time for other big nations uh, to have a role in, in, in the future new world order, if you call it like that. And it's the same with Chinese. So if you want to understand uh, China, just have a look at the opium wars in the 19th century. And then you have an idea of, uh, what happened there done by the Europeans and why they are thinking how they think today. Yeah? And, you know, the, especially the Westerners, we love to hear what we like. And we are happy if we see that Xi Jinping and Biden is shaking hands and we're saying, oh, everything is fine. They're not on the side of Russia and things like that. Yeah? But to 100%, there are things hidden in the dark. Uh, there are these red eyes who look, uh, who look at you and things are happening there, 100% uh, sure. Yeah? Because uh, especially the Chinese, they think, okay, now it's our time. And now we have uh, also, as a great power, show that we have a clear understanding about strategy and how we would progress in the future. And of course, the situation at the moment is not that for China because uh, Russia is more or less... Uh, a very resource-rich country. You might argue, okay, the, all these pipelines are still not built, whatever it is, but think what happened in 10, 15 to 20 years. And if you want to cement great power on a basis which will last for another 100 or 200 years, then you have to think strategic. And that's what the Chinese do and also, the, um, also India is doing. Yeah? So I would even say that <laughs> there is already some kind of political earthquake, which uh, starts uh, to, 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 um, to show uh, itself in a way that um, very likely the world, like we see it at the moment, will change rapidly and in a way we 
would have not imagined. And um, again, the historians will tell you in 100 years that was very clear that this will happen. At the moment, we are like a one-day fly, uh, flying around on a nice, uh, let's say, sunny morning, having no idea what these uh, clouds on the, on, 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 in the sky mean. And when the first raindrop starts to fall, then we think, okay, pooh, what is this? And we still have no idea that winter is coming, for example. Eh? But I completely agree that we will see in the next years to come uh, very uh, deep changes um, in a way we wouldn't have expected it a couple of years uh, before. So final question, uh, as we are approaching the end of this uh, episode, uh, let's say we meet in one year from now and it is uh, going to be the second anniversary of uh, the war. What what will you say? What will be the, let's say, the, your three takeaways if we are to meet in one year from now? So first of all, um... I actually would hope that this will not happen, that we will meet again, because that means that another several thousand people will die until uh, the second anniversary. This is the, the unfortunate uh, development we can see here. I think that three key takeaways which we can take with us here is, first of all, the human being is still a human being, which is somehow not able to understand that uh, to use war as a solution for whatever, I don't know, idea, strategy, whatever it is, uh, can be ruled out. No, war is still an instrument of political power. Yeah? And uh, Russia showed this to us very clearly, and it was a shock for the Europeans because they thought, well, there will be no war again, and of course there will be no war in Europe. Yeah? And I'm always saying no one cared about the war in Syria, for example, no one cared about the wars in Africa or, let's say, in the Middle East. But now the Europeans, because it's on their doorstep, and now they all let's say, a little bit uh, shocked and, 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 and running around like a bunch of chicken and trying to find themselves. So I, I'm, maybe I'm a little bit <laughs> accelerating the situation, but I just would like to make sure that you understand this, of course. And uh, yes, we have seen a lot of things. So also here, I think um, a lot of unity. So a lot of said, well, the Europeans, they will not be able to come to a somehow a common uh, idea of a situation, common understanding, but also this we have seen. Yeah? So there was a lot of done, even the sanction packages. Yeah, of course, they might not help on the short term, but they will help on the mid and long term. And this is also quite interesting, of course. And there are some some cracks and there are, uh, let's say, countries who think different like the other ones. But also this is quite interesting to see that even um, a society in the 21st century, which is um, very often considered as weak and not very strong, uh, can actually come up with strong solutions. So this is the second uh, key takeaway, I would say here. Well, and the third one is... Um, that things, when it comes to war fighting, in a way, so this is interesting for me as a military person, when it comes to war fighting, we all thought that the wars of the future, they will fought exclusively by drones, okay, uh, 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 artificial intelligence will be, uh, let's say, the most important power, cyber uh, domain is the decisive domain and things like that. Yeah? This is still all true, right? because, uh, for example, if it comes to drones, that every so let's on an average day we will have about we, we do have about three and a half to four thousand drones flying around in ukraine for example so there are a lot of drones around and those drones are the sensors who are the ones who bring in the, all the information which you can use then in targeting for example yeah? but to see once again pictures like in the first world war in the trenches of bakhmut for example as we have seen in severodonetsk yeah? or let's say realizing that the Russians very likely used until now over 7 million artillery shells. Yeah? So these kind of things, they are really shocking in a way, yeah? because you see that uh, those kind of um, attritional wars are still, they are still here. Uh, they, they haven't left the room. And of course, the, the nuclear the question is still on the table, and again, we see that um, being a nuclear power has changed pretty much everything. Uh, we see this uh, when you look at the North Korea, we see this if you, if you look at uh, Israel, we see this when you look uh, at China, United States, and of course now Russia, because uh, that means that you cannot come up with a short and quick war in a way. No, it will be a very long attritional war until the moment one side actually understands and accepts that uh, they will not win and have to go to the negotiation table. This is the, the sad thing, actually, I would say in the end. 
And it will be a long war, especially in the case when the one country, the country that is attacked, uh, has only two options, namely the options between a war or a complete subjugation. So, yeah. Colonel Marcus Reisner, thank you very much for joining us today thank you and for, for covering uh, this um, this uh, highly interesting, uh, highly interesting aspects of uh, of the warfare. And of course, I agree with you. I hope that we. Uh, when we meet next time, it's not going to be the topic of Russia's war against Ukraine, but we will have more, let's say, optimistic uh, perspectives on yeah. uh, the questions of uh, peace and war. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the best to you, Melina. Really.